Since J is for Jesus, then the task ahead of me for the next 45 minutes is monumental, especially with Ephesians 3.8 looming over me as we get ready to dive into Jesus today. Listen to the Apostle Paul as he says, to me, though I am very, the, the, the very least of all the saints, this grace, he says, was given to me to preach. Here it comes, Times Square Church, to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. Think of that phrase. Paul says the unsearchable riches of Christ. How do you communicate unsearchable in 45 minutes? Well, if you go to Times Square Church in an hour, how do you communicate that? Especially when unsearchable means riches that can never be fully explored or discovered, that, that you're faced with boundless content as you're getting ready to dive into Jesus, the name of Jesus. I thought it was overwhelming as we were speaking on God and the Holy Spirit, the nation of Israel, all of these things. And it seems that each week I'm more overwhelmed. I wonder if that's why there are 256 names given in the Bible for Jesus. Because you cannot pin him down with just one name. This is Jesus, the name above every other name. We're... Where do you start with Jesus? Think of this for a moment. He's the orphan, the father to the orphans. He's the husband to the widow. He's for those that travel at night. He is the bright and morning star. And to those that are in a desert time, he's the cloud by day and the fire by night. To those that may be walking in the valley, hallelujah, he is the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon. He's the honey in the rock. He's a table prepared in the presence of my enemies. He's the brightness of God's glory, the express image of God's person. He's the king of glory, the pearl of great price. He's a rock in a weary land, a cup that never runs over, the rod and the staff that comforts me. He, the government shall rest upon his shoulders. How do you explain Jesus? Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the son of the living God, but my companion, my savior, who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Now think of it. He astounds and confounds every expert in every field. Ha. In chemistry, how do you deal with turning water into wine? In biology, how do you deal with the virgin birth? In physics, he disproved the law of gravity when he ascended into heaven. And in economics, he began to blow them away when he turned five loaves and two fishes into enough food for 5,000 people. In medicine, he cured the sick without getting a prescription from Dwayne Reeves. He had no servants and they called him master. He had no degree and they called him teacher. He had no medicines and no doctorate and they called him healer. He had no army and yet he was a king that feared. He won no military battles but yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime and they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, but you couldn't keep him in there because death couldn't hold him down. In Handel's oratorios, whenever God was about to enter in to the music of Friedrich Handel, they would hear, he would purposely play the trumpets. So whenever you heard the trumpets in any of Handel's pieces, you knew that God was drawing near. It was the signal that deity was entering in, not just an ordinary person, not just the singer. God was coming into the room. And as I read these verses today, I want you to hear trumpets. I want you to be overwhelmed with Jesus today. I want him to knock you off your feet today. And in fact, Jesus actually knocked people off their feet in John 18. I want to read it to you. Jesus just finishes praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. The disciples slept, but Judas was active in his betrayal. He knew where Jesus would be, and so Judas led the Roman soldiers right into the garden. And when I was reading this passage this week, I heard trumpets as I was 
reading this, my heart knew that deity was in that garden. Listen to this. This is just hours before the mock trial, before they would beat him and lead him to Calvary. This is in Gethsemane. Listen to these words. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. And it said this, Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Keep that in mind, weapons. So Jesus, knowing all things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Jesus leads the conversation, says, whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. Here it comes, folks. And so he said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying them, was standing with them. So when he said to them, here come the trumpets, I am he, the whole Roman cohort fell backwards to the ground. He just, he just said, I am he, and bam, all of them fell to the ground. This, to me, is amazing. Verse 5 tells us that Jesus responded with the phrase that sent this tremor to the soul. All Jesus said was, I am. That's the original, not I am he. The original is I am. That's what he was saying. Last Friday, I don't know if you knew, but New York City had an earthquake. One hand went up. Very perceptive church. <laughs> Registered 2.2. At 1.53 a.m. in the morning at Yonkers, and it said it took place six miles under the earth, um, under Yonkers. 2.2 on .2 the Richter scale. The Richter scale goes from 1 to 10. And never in world history has there ever been a 10. And they said, because if there was, no one would be there to tell you that we had a 10. <laughs> Except one day in Israel, on John chapter 18, I think when Jesus said, I am. I think the Richter scale started to go up at that point, and men couldn't stand on their feet because they were standing in the presence of God. When the Roman soldiers heard the two words, I am, they dropped to their knees. These men who were armed with weapons dropped like bowling pins in his presence. You know what was interesting to me? Verse 3 says it was a Roman cohort. Do you know a Roman cohort is 600 soldiers? 600 soldiers going to get Jesus. And when he said, I am, 601 people, I'm adding Judas, 601 people fell to the ground that day. And what Jesus was saying to them was basically this, is that beyond any doubt, I want you to know who's in control of this conversation right now. You may have come with weapons. You may have come with numbers. You may have come with a warrant to arrest me. You may have come with an edict from Caesar himself. But I just want you to know two words just dropped all of you. So I want you to know that no man takes my life from me, but I willingly lay it down. I have seen that knockdown ability. I've watched it in my own life. When I was pastoring my first church in Detroit, when a gentleman that we brought in that we thought we, we maybe we were just young, we thought we led him to the Lord and came in and stayed with me in my house, in my apartment there in Detroit, Michigan. And while we were there, um, the Holy Spirit spoke to me one morning. He was only with me two days, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and says, you need to get rid of this man. He's trying to kill you. I, I didn't know anything. It's the first time I'm even thinking. That, I, I mean, I'm 27. I'm just pastoring my first church. I thought everybody loved me. And so I, I called him up, got him a job, called him up and said, hey, before you come back to the apartment, I said, would you meet me at the church? And I got some of our big ushers and and, and thought we would, we would meet Daniel there. And I remember this man coming in, and I said, Daniel, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I said, I've never heard this before in my life. And I can tell you, at almost 60 years old, I've never heard it again. He said, get rid of that man. He's trying to kill you. And when I said that, folks, I'm telling you, God is my witness. His eyes rolled back in his head. And all of a sudden, this demonic voice came out. And he said, ha! He said, I have been commissioned to come here to kill you. 
and thank, I, I thought the big ushers were going to help me. And this man started to come at me, and all of a sudden, it wasn't those ushers that helped me. I looked at him and I said, stand back in Jesus' name. I, I watched a man that had an assignment from hell to kill this 27-year-old young man all of a sudden have to begin to move back. Not because of ushers and not because of me, not because of a degree and not because of Bible college. It was because of the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. I still believe it can knock people backwards. And in fact, if you're listening today like a Roman soldier and you're like they were armed with weapons, if you're here in this building or watching online from around the world, maybe someone sent you this in China or Romania, maybe you're listening from the Philippines right now or the UK, and maybe you're armed with doubts and cynicism, maybe you've armed and put up walls of atheism and agnostic, I tell you that when, when you understand who he is, swords and ideologies and labels you have placed upon yourself, if it's the real Jesus, it can't stand in his presence. Everything gets knocked back. He stands and says, I am. The Jew understood I am from all the way back in Exodus 3, from a burning bush when God identified himself to Moses with these words, I am. It's the name God answered Moses with when he asked the question, whom shall I say sent me? And God from a burning bush said, tell them I am. And when Jesus says I am, Jesus is saying I am God. Make no mistake what Jesus was saying. When Jesus says I am, Jesus is saying I am God. Because you understand when you know the power of who he is, you don't need anything else. I, I, I laugh because when you read John 18, just, just four verses later, it's almost this crazy contrast that the apostle Peter pulls out a little dagger and cuts off a soldier's ear. And I wanted to go, Peter, did you not just see 600 and one people fall down with two words. What is your little dagger going to do? My, my two ushers were my two little daggers to help me. And Jesus goes, what do you need these men for when you have the name of Jesus to walk with you through every situation? Why this story is important to understand who Jesus is is because prior to John 18, in the Gospel of John, Jesus said these words, I am seven different times. We're going to let Jesus describe himself because every time Jesus used one of the I am metaphors, he emphatically was stating that he was Yahweh, the great I am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was declaring those words. So instead of trying to get information from somebody else, let's hear what Jesus said because these are claims that he is God and every time he uttered them, it began to set the crowds against him. I am is a present tense phrase. It's not I was in the past or I might be in the future, but I am right here, hallelujah, and right now. When he said I am, he says you don't have to look in the future or the past. You know I am a very present help in time of trouble. And what follows these seven I am's reveals something important about his nature, his mission, his character. Jesus adds what we would call in theology an adjectival noun. It's, it is something that he revealed about himself. Just get ready to take quick pictures or just write these down real fast. But we'll, we'll jump into them real fast here. He says seven different times. First, he says, I am the bread of life in John 6.35. And then he says, I am the light of the world in John 8, 12. Then Jesus says, I am the door in John 10, 7. Then in John 10, 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. At the tomb of a friend named Lazarus, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And just before he was about to go into, into the garden of Gethsemane, he says in John 15 at the upper room discourse, I am the true vine. And then he says 
in that same upper room, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Each I am represents a spiritual need that every man and woman here today need, that need him right here and right now. Every one of these words represent that as we go through this. And here's what's important. This is why we need to know who Jesus, not letting men define who Jesus, we, we've reversed it so easily. Jesus did not come to elaborate some system of theology of some, some, some seminary. Jesus defines men. Men don't define Jesus. Jesus is going to tell us who he is with these seven, let's call them knockdown names. So if we mess up who he is, then all of our systems are messed up. He, we, we, we have built Jesus. Jesus, we have built him from books and textbooks. And Jesus steps out of books and out of sermons. He steps out of denominations and out of theologies. He steps out of graves and he steps out of all time and place. And he stands there looming over all of us and saying, this is who I am. Let me define and tell you who I am. Because of this thing, get this. Jesus builds his church on the confession of who he is. He doesn't let us build the church on our systems. He lets us build the church on his name, his character, and who he is. If our church is known for a system or a theology, we've missed it. Because it's only the church that identifies with Christ can begin to stand against the gates of hell. There's not a system, there's not a seminary, there's not a preacher or a theologian that can stand against what's coming this way. But there is a name which is above every single name that can stand against anything that is coming our way. Hallelujah. So here we go. Everything is going to be in the Gospel of John. Get your Bibles ready. Turn it on. Turn your phone on. Don't text. Go to John. The Gospel of John is the most unique gospel because it doesn't start out like the other three gospels. Because John takes us to the beginning, the real beginning. Listen to how John starts. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, doesn't, okay, look at that verse. Doesn't it sound like Genesis 1-1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, now get ready now. Strap in. Here's what's astounding about Jesus. The in the beginning of John takes place before the in the beginning of Genesis. That Jesus, Jesus was on a throne was the son of God way before even God created anything in our universe. What does that mean? Okay, you ready for this? Okay, let, let's okay, stay strapped in. Here it comes. Jesus is the only person who lived before he was born. He's the only person who lived before he was born. He was already there, folks. This is what makes it amazing. And as one theologian said, Jesus is the invisible God, and God is the invisible, is the visible Jesus. And that visible Jesus was to embark about a three-year ministry in the Gospel of John. I love when you think of what is being said here in the Gospel of John. I think of the words from the French Emperor Napoleon who said this. He says, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus is not a man. Superficial minds see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions. And this is what he said. He said, that resemblance does not exist. There is between Christianity and every other religion, I love this, the distance of infinity. He says, there is no comparison when you start to deal with this. Because Christianity has never been about encountering the right church. It's about encountering the right person. It's finding the person of Jesus Christ. So today, let's go after these seven knockdown names. I've, I, listen, I try to time this and, and just go, I, I, have, I have little, little to, thank you. I'm going to. The, so when all of you leave, he's going to stay. So that one guy will stay there. 
I go in, God, I have seven names. I don't even know how I'm going to do this. I don't even know why you keep showing up every single week. So here we go. Seven knockdown names of Jesus. And here we go. Number one, he says, I am the bread of life. John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. I think C.S. Lewis said it best when he said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, then the most probable explanation is that we've been made for another world. That's such an important thing to remember. If we find ourselves that nothing in this world can satisfy, it's because you have been made for a higher purpose, something else. See, the setting in John chapter 6 is Jesus has miraculously fed 5,000 people on two loaves and five fish, on, on two fishes and five loaves. And this was the point of Jesus' absolute popularity. That everybody was looking at him and said, we want you to be king. In fact, it said that they were forcibly going to make Jesus king because somehow they were getting free bread. Why not? Make him king. It's free stuff. And all of a sudden, Jesus steps back and says, you're, you're looking at the wrong nourishment. You're looking at the wrong meal. He says, you're looking at bread that you can hold. That will never satisfy you. And so Jesus had to explain to them that I am the bread of life. Now, just keep this in mind, because bread to us is different than what bread to them was. Bread to us is the appetizer that we get in the little basket and the little plastic things of butter, and you sit there and put it on, and so you eat the bread before you get the entree and before you get the main meal. But what is interesting about this time frame is bread was the main meal in the first century. What Jesus was saying was, stop making me, or maybe in our Western mindset, stop making me an appetizer when I am the meal. Stop making me on Sundays that you just butter me up just a little bit with some of your singing when I need to be your meal every single day, that I need to be the one that comes and does this. Jesus is not our pre-meal appetizer, that we get a little basket of, of the word and music on Sunday and said, here's Jesus, butter him up a little bit, then go eat your meal wherever you want every single day. Folks, always remember, there are many things that can fill us, but only one thing that can fulfill us, and that is Jesus, the bread of life. See, nothing on this planet can fill you up enough and to not need God. Get to the top of anything. Listen to me. Listen to me carefully. Get to the top of anything in your field and in your studies, and you will still be unfulfilled if God is not there. And you may be sitting here, and you could be an athlete. You may be sitting here, and you may be on Broadway. You may maybe reach the apex on Wall Street, the UN, the, your education, the medical field. Maybe in the tech companies here in New York City and around the world watching from London or Manila. Maybe you're sitting here watching from France and Paris or Rome, and you've reached the top of everything, listen carefully, is that to do life without God that you will find when you get to the top, something is always missing because that can never fulfill you. Only God can fulfill you because when you reach your goals, if God is not there, you have tasted something that still leaves an empty spot inside of you, but I'm here to tell you, he is the bread of life, and he is the one that can fulfill you today. I'm so excited that I can say, number two, I am the light of the world. John 8, 12, then Jesus again spoke to them and saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When I started in ministry, I lived in some crazy places that I could, that I was, some apartments that I could barely afford. And some of those apartments, um, when you would go into the kitchen and turn on those lights, they know in that section over there what that means. How many know where I'm going with this? When you turn on those lights and you watch those roaches begin to go. I had an apartment that I'm telling you, it would have made Indiana Jones cringe. It was just, I, I remember some apartments, I don't, I, I, I had mice, I've had roaches, I've all, but here's what I realized. When I turned the lights on, the light did not create the roaches. The light exposed the roaches. Those roaches were always there. So when I turned the light on, it wasn't God going, let there be light and let there be bugs. It was, they were always there. 
See, when Jesus came into the world, God switched on the lights. And I'm going to tell you, and there were roaches. Jesus says, I am the light of the world in the context of a group of religious people getting ready to stone a woman that was caught in adultery. And the light of this world showed up at that moment and spoke those famous words, he is without sin, let him cast the first stone. The men put down their stones and Jesus said to them, I am the light of the world. Always keep this in mind that light reveals and light exposes. Jesus came to a dark world and suddenly turned on the light by his personal presence. Light exposed a failing religion. Religion would have stoned this woman when Jesus wanted to give her a second chance. Light reveals what sin is, whether it was adultery in a woman or whether it was in a failing religious system with men that had titles and men that had positions, but men that didn't have God. And light comes in and exposes everything. Light reveals all of this. That's what Jesus came. When Jesus walked, when Jesus comes into your life, I'm telling you, the lights go on. And things that never bothered you before start to bother you now. Because he's turned the light on these things and saying, that's not right. Break that off. He doesn't love you. And all of a sudden, you start to see what is real. And, and what's amazing, when I was reading John 8, Jesus doesn't just say, I am once in John 8, 12. He kept saying it over and over again, almost like just to go after them. So he says in John 8, 12, I'm the light of the world. Then in John 8, 24, he says, therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And then he doesn't stop. Verse 28, he says, when you lift up the son of man, you will know that I am and do nothing on my own initiative. Then look at verse 58. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, what does it say? I am. Four times, and they couldn't take it. You know what the next verse says after verse 58? Look at verse 59. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. Because Jesus hid himself and left the temple. Because every time he said, I am, when Jesus was saying, I am, he was saying, I am God. And that's what was beginning to get at them, that they had to pick up stones. Because if they weren't going to submit to God, don't, don't miss this. Don't miss this. If you weren't going to bow and submit to God, then you're going to try to have to eliminate God. That's the society that we live in. If you don't submit and bow, then you have to eliminate. That's why in most trials, as Josh McDowell said, people are tried for what they have done. But this was not true of Christ. Jesus was tried for who he is. That's what, that's what he was put on trial for. And all the roaches ran when Jesus came as the light of the world. Jesus was giving revelation on sin. Jesus was giving revelation on religion. See, here's what's amazing, is that people want church, but we don't want Jesus. We want a church that stays stays moderately in this and back up. Because if we, this, what this does, it begins to expose its light. So what happens is if we can keep Jesus out of our songs and do enough of songs, that's why I'm so grateful for Ricardo and, and Kareem with the choir. You, you, there's some songs you sing, you don't know if you're talking about a man and a woman and a love relationship, and you're just going, what, what, what really is that? What are they really talking about? The thing I love about this is that every time they sing, you know it's about Jesus. Because if he's the light of the world, light exposes and light reveals. And what's interesting is that this is the only name that Jesus says, I need you to be what I am. This is the only knockdown name that Jesus said, you need to become this. Because Jesus tells us that we are to be what? The light of the world. That's Matthew 5, 14. What he was saying is that everywhere we go, we better show off Jesus. Not anything else, not our system, not anything, but Jesus himself. Because Jesus is the only one. How does the church do that? You ready? Let me explain how the church does it. I have to do this real quickly because we've got like five other names to do. So here it is. How do you do that? How, how does someone become light? All I thought about was this. 
I grew up in the church in Long Island. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and we used to do this thing that some of you don't even know about called VBS, Vacation Bible School. How many remember VBS? Well, I had to go every, t- every summer. So they would bring me over, and you'd win prizes and all this, and every year they'd always have this giant Hershey chocolate bar. Never would win it. There was always some girl from Queens. And so I would never win the Hershey chocolate bar. But I remember one year I won the glow-in-the-dark cross. And I remember bringing it home, turning off the lights, and it, it, was, it was bogus. Wouldn't even glow in the dark. It was this, it was this yellowish thing going like, I win this. I memorize that verse. I get this bogus cross, and I can't even get it to glow in the dark. And then there was this little thing on the bottom. In order for it to glow, you have to expose it to light. Because when you expose it to light, something happened to it that when you turned off the light, the light not of its own, but the light that it got from somewhere else allowed it to glow in... Okay. This, this section is getting it right here. These guys are, I know it's the 10, come to the one. So what happens is, is that when you get exposed to Jesus, who is the light of the world, you can't glow on your own, but you can glow if you are exposed to who Jesus is. He is the light of the world. Number three, I am the door. John 10, 7, Jesus said to them again, truly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I wasn't going to do the rest of these verses, but they're too good. Here's what he says. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. Go in and find pasture, in and out and find pasture. And then this verse, you know this. The thief comes only to steal kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Hallelujah. Isn't it interesting when you think of sheep, no college or university in America uses sheep as their mascot. No such thing as the Michigan sheep. Ohio State lambs. The Florida sheep. You just don't do it. You know why? Because sheep can't attack. They are the prey. They are the attacked, but they can't attack. They have no, def- all they, they, they have no mechanism to fight. That's why there's not a university in America that will ever use the sheep. It's always like a wolverine or a, you know, or, 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 or a gator or something like that. But you don't, no, nobody's a sheep, LSU sheep. Nobody uses that because they don't fight. Sheep are only as strong as their shepherds. It's the only way they have strength is not inherent inside of them. And when Jesus said, I am the door, it's a shepherd phrase. There were no doors on sheepfolds. There'd be three sides of walls except for one spot on the fourth side where there'd be an opening And that is where the shepherd would lie down at night and actually call himself the door or the gate. The door was protection that no sheep could get out. The door was the protection that no enemy could get in. When I was in Detroit, the number one entry point that the the Detroit police said that thieves would come in and steal was the front door of a house. They said that was the number one entry for those that would break for B&E. They would come up and kick in that door and take whatever they would want. We need a strong door. Because for anything to go in or come out, at this time, Jesus was saying it was going to have to come through the shepherd. And I believe that when sheep wander and stray, that they can't do it without going, according to this, going over that shepherd or climbing over him. It's not easy for a sheep to stray when you have an alert shepherd as your doorkeeper. Or let me put it to you this way. I think you have to work hard to walk away from God. 
I think it's harder than we think. I don't think it's easy to go to hell. Because I think God loves you too much going, I'm not going to let you just do what you want without sending people to come and speak and to get a word. I think you may be sitting here today just going like, I'm here because this girl invited me and I wanted a date and they brought me here to this church. And that's what I know it. I know it. Some of you are going like, did you tell him? No, we just know. We just know this stuff. That's what it is. Some of you came here from a hotel because you went to the concierge and said, I want to go to a gospel church. And you showed up here and now you can't leave because you sat in the middle. And now you're sitting here today. I think it's hard to go to hell. I believe these words that Spurgeon spoke to the church. He said, heaven and hell are not faraway places. You may be in heaven before the clock ticks noon or you may be in hell. Now listen to these words that he says. He says, if then you are damned, let them have this one thing as a consolation for your misery, that you are not damned for the lack of calling after you. You are not lost for the lack of prayer and weeping for you. If a sinner be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms around their knees, imploring them to stay. In hell must be filled at least, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let not one of them go unwarned and unprayed for. Oh, that what? Would the damned in hell give for a sermon if they could be listen and respond once more? They would consent, if it were possible, to bear 10,000 years of hell's torments if they might have one more time the word presented to them. So then Spurgeon says this, preach the gospel, the gates of hell will shake. Preach the gospel and prodigals will return. Preach the gospel to every creature. It is the master's mandate. Now don't miss this part. And he says this, the sermon which does not lead to Christ of which Jesus is not the top and the bottom, is the sort of sermon that makes devils in hells laugh, but make angels of God weep. We need messages that bring people to Christ. People there. But here's the good news. My preaching will fail you. My prayers would fail you. But I have a strong door that protects me against the enemy and protects me from going into places that I don't have to go to. There, some years ago, one of the airlines boasted that they are 99% safe when they are flying in the air. 99% safe. I, I'm worried about that 1%. But good news, we got a 100% door that will protect us every single time. Number four, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's the fourth I am. When we get to the noun portion of the I am statements, it's always the door, the light, the bread. But this one is different. He adds good to it. He doesn't say I am the shepherd. He says I am the what? Good shepherd. The excellent one. No one is even like me. Always keep this in mind. Sheep are dependent animals. You never graduate from being a sheep. The older you get, the more you realize you need a good shepherd. It's the young sheep that think they can do it without God. It's the young sheep that are going like, yeah, I got this. I'll just, I'll just have Jesus as the bread appetizer on Sunday. But the older you get, I need him every single day. Do you know why? He said, sheep are prone to wander. 1 Peter 2.25, you were continually straying like sheep, but now you return to the shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Here's what I've learned, that the shepherd's sling, here's what a good shepherd does. The shepherd's sling was not just for a wolf, but it was also for the sheep. He would have stones to hit a wolf, but he would have a sling of stones that he would throw it. Whenever he saw a sheep wandering to a place they shouldn't go, he'd throw a stone, not to hit them, but to create a noise for them to be frightened back and go, I'm not supposed to go there. Can, can I tell you, folks? I want you, to, I want you to get this. The shepherd would send a stone in that direction. It was not to hit the sheep, but the sound was to drive him back. I have found myself about to make a wrong decision. Then I heard something. I had a warning. I felt like the shepherd slung a stone and said, don't, don't, don't say yes to that. Don't, don't choose that. Don't go that way. Don't say yes to that person. Don't hire them. Don't give money to this. Don't do that. How many have ever heard that stone that all of a sudden it got you back? That's the good shepherd that says, listen, I'm trying to make sure that you, if you could hear the stone now, you don't have to be rescued later on. 
that that's what he does. That's what the good shepherd does. It's happened with purchases and partnerships and hiring and in friendships. It was the rock of the shepherd that said, back off from this. Don't go this way. That's a good shepherd. Number five, I am the resurrection and the life. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. This is the story of Lazarus. It's Mary and Martha. And he speaks this to Martha. We always seem, and this is why he had a say to her. We always seem to want Jesus' hand, but we don't want Jesus' calendar. We want Jesus to show up when we want him to. All I remember is an old church mother always saying to me, he may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. John 11, Lazarus starts off the chapter sick, but by the middle of the chapter, he hasn't been in the grave for four days. And can I just tell you, Jesus was still right on time. Jesus speaks to Martha. What was frustrating to Martha is that Jesus didn't come when they called him. He came on his timetable because she's thinking it would be easier for Jesus to come to sick Lazarus and not dead Lazarus. And sometimes Jesus delays because he would rather, here it comes, resurrect than heal the situation. Some of you think, well, if healing, I'll feel better. But if I, Jesus goes, but if I resurrect, there's a whole bunch more that I'm able to do. Martha knew that Jesus can heal in time, but here it comes, folks. But she didn't know the Jesus who had authority beyond the grave and over death. She didn't know. She knew the healer, but she didn't know the resurrector. See, resurrection in life means life is not over when the doctor says it's over. There is resurrection in life beyond this life. That's why we don't fear death. Let me say this to you. On Friday morning, here in New York City, we lost one of our fine pastors. Tim Keller, the pastor of Redeemer, has gone to be with the Lord. He fought pancreatic cancer for three years. We as the choir, we prayed for Tim Keller this morning. Cindy and I started to pray for Tim Keller and his healing every night for almost three years. And on Friday, we got the news that Tim Keller passed into eternity. I thought of a story when Tim Keller passed away I couldn't remember what news network it was on, but they followed. It was one of the most intriguing things. This newscaster followed four cancer patients that were all diagnosed with terminal cancer, and they wanted to see what they would, how they would act all the way until they came to their final moments of their life. And they were showing, some were getting angry, some were showing regrets, but there was this one old pastor, I think he was from Mississippi, that the closer he came, the more joyful he got. <laughs> because, and I'm going to tell you, just keep this in mind, because he knew Jesus is the resurrection. And, the, and they finally asked him, I'll never forget this, they finally asked him, his vo he was losing his voice from all the chemo, and, it was, and the hair, everything. And while everybody else was going, I don't know why it's me, I'm a good person, I should have done the, all these things. But this one old minister from the South, when they asked him, how are you showing joy and peace in all this? And all he could say was an old hymn that he sang. This is what he said. He looked at the news camera and he said, I'm pressing on the upward way. He goes, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on solid ground. Then he said, Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on Canaan's table land. A higher plane I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. And then I, just when you thought he was over, he had to go into verse 2. He said, my heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. I'm going, boy, that's good. Then he had to say verse 3. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled, for faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of the saints. That's higher ground. Just when I'm about to walk away, that old man goes, verse four. <laughs> I want to scale the utmost height. K 
catch a gleam of glory bright, but still I'll pray till rest I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Hallelujah. That old preacher had peace. Tim Keller had peace because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We got to get ready to close. I know I got two more to go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's do this. The music, come up. Let them think we're ending. Come on. Let them think we're finished. I'll do these fast. Come on, all, if you think, I want you to think that we, Mark, you know, play the songs that, the closing songs, whatever. I'm the true vine. John 15, 1, I'm the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. These are the last words of Jesus. John 15 are Jesus' plans to keep you producing, flourishing, and fruit bearing. Jesus is the vine, and he says, we are the branches. And he says, I'm giving you a new expression. He says, before I was with you, now I need you to stay connected to me. He says, the branches are going to be the expression. You are the branches. Jesus is the vine. And you need to stay connected to him. You are the expression of that connection. And, he's, and he, he was telling us that fruit expresses the attachment. The closer you stay to the vine, the more fruit comes. What's fruit, Pastor Tim? Fruit means the character of Jesus. Let me say something else about fruit. This is important. Fruit exists for the benefit of others. You ready for this? Okay, here it comes. Get this now. Why don't cows drink milk and chicken eat eggs? Some of you are going, whoa. Wow. No cow gives milk and goes, hey, I only do 2%. Cows don't do that. And no chicken goes, I like them over easy. They produce for somebody else. And it, look, here it comes. I haven't even gotten to M yet, which is in a few weeks. M is money. You, God doesn't give you the ability with money to use it on. That, if you've got a gift to make money, that's not for you. I knew you'd get upset about that. That's okay. I knew. So if you've got a gift to sing, if you've got a gift to serve, that's not for you. That's for other people. He says, when you say, he says, but you've got to stay connected to me in order for that to flourish. Branches can't boast in and of themselves. See, fruit is the glory of the vine. It tells people you are connected to something. And the enemy of the branch is anything that will disconnect you. That's the enemy. In fact, you know abide means the branch is connected and whatever destroys abiding is your enemy. And here's, what's, here's what I want you to understand. Do you know the word abiding in six verses appears 10 times? Abide, 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 abide. Stay connected, stay connected. It says when you're not abiding, men will take over. That's what it says. When you are abiding, you become a prayer force. You can ask whatever you will. It says, and God begins to. Let me just read it to you. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch, dries. Do you know what happens when you're not abiding? First thing that happens is you dry up. You dry up in your faith. And they gather. And abiding is not an easy word. It means you have to do a little bit of some work to produce fruit. How many know you don't have to tell your kids to eat dessert? I command you, eat this cake. None of it. Why? Because that's easy. But, but to abide, this is not, this is, this is, this is vegetable. This is going, I've got to work on this. I've got to spend time. I've got to get up a little bit earlier and be with him because I don't want to dry up. It says, when you dry up, it says, men gather you. You're at the, you're at the control of people's hands that people start to, that's what it says. It says, but if, if you abide in me, here it comes, my words abide in you, you become a prayer force. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Okay, this is it. This is really the last one more, I promise. John 7, I mean, uh, this is number 7. Here it comes. Stand up, because you'll pretend we're done. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Here it is. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. You know what I love about this, Pat? Jesus gives the most controversial statement ever in his whole ministry over dinner. 
John 13, 2 says that it was during supper. I don't know about you, I come from an Italian family and a lot of stuff happened around the dinner table. We learn politics, we learn theology, we've had fights, arguments, we've had family pick up whole pizza pies and walk out. We've had it all happen in our house, everything. That's why I don't think it was any, any mistake that Jesus goes, gives the most controversial statement of his entire ministry. I am, here it comes, the way. Jesus did not say a way, he said the way. That's what he said. Jesus did not give us truths, but declared he was the truth. So folks, here it comes. Let me just say this. He says, I am the way. This upsets people, and here's where we end. Get this down. If there were a, th a thousand ways to God, men would want a thousand and one. Because the issue is, is not how many ways lead us to God. The issue is God gave us a way to God. And we know how to get to heaven, but men are angry with it. Why? Because men don't want simplicity. They want autonomy. They want to decide. You want to decide how to get to heaven. I'm a good person. I haven't heard it. And Jesus goes, that's not up for, that's not up for grabs. That's not even up for discussion. Jesus goes, I am the... So if you're here today from a different religion, from a different ideology, and all of a sudden you don't like Jesus saying, I am the way, that's why Christianity can't coincide with a hundred other religions. Jesus just separated himself at that point. When he said, I am the way, he said, back off. We can't do this. So we can't stand at Yankee Stadium and put all the religions up there going, aren't we all the same? Mm -mm. Not according to John 14, 6. Jesus said, we can't coexist because I just told you I am the way. So here's the deal. You're already standing, so you're going to get ready to go. So all the angry people, just wait. Just wait. I know you're going to try to turn me off, but you're going, I, I want to turn him off, but I want to see how much more he's going to spit. Stay with me. Here it comes. We want to, you want to decide how to get there. You don't even know how to get to heaven because you've never been there. So how do you know? My friend Hans, look, he's here from Dallas. I've never been to his house. I've been to his office, but if I would say, hey, I'll get to your house, and he was to go like, you don't even know how to get there. How ridiculous would that be? He would have to give me directions. Hey, go here, turn this way, this, do this. All. Because he knows how to get to his own house. Here it comes. Jesus knows how to get to his own house. He knows how to get to his own house. So stop pretending your way is right. I haven't hurt anybody. I'm a good husband. I provide. The bills are paid. Great. I was christened. I was baptized. I'm a Jew. I'm a Muslim. I'm a Protestant. Ooh, I'm a Baptist. That ain't going to help you. And please don't say in heaven, I'm from TSC. Please, I beg you don't say that. Because when you come to me and go, hey, remember me? I'm going to go, I don't know. In the words of Jesus, I never knew you. <laughs> Here's what I will say. There is only one way to get you to heaven. His name is Jesus. That's it. That's it. That's why Matthew 22 says, what do you think of Christ? Was that question has to turn into, what shall I do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Jesus today? No man can see the kingdom of heaven unless they're born again. That's Jesus' way. Jesus' words. If you've never been born again, it's the most important question anybody could ever ask you. And here's the good news today. When Christ changes you from the inside out, you don't just get Jesus the Savior. You get the bread of life, the light of the world, the resurrection and the life, the vine, the true vine, the good shepherd, the door. You get it all when you get the Son of God. I'll tell you more about that at the one o'clock service. But let me just say this to you. So you're going like, is he trying to get us back? You can't go to heaven without Jesus, and it can happen right now. It, it, don't even bow your heads. I'm, I'm just, just, let's just get this right. You know the truth of who he is. So make no mistake, we can't get you there as a church. Your denomination, your religion can't get you there. There's not a cathedral or a mosque. There's not a synagogue or a church that can get you there. Only Jesus can. 
there's only one name under heaven and earth where salvation comes, and it's the name Jesus. And today, he is there to give salvation. He calls it being born again. What does that mean? Just as you had a first birth physically, you need a second birth spiritually. You have a birth date, you need a spiritual birth. How does that happen? A, B, C. A, admitting I'm a sinner. I'm broken on the inside. We all have a condition called sin, and you can't fix it with a priest, a pastor, a promise, a program, a prescription. You need help to fix it. B, it's by believing that God sent his son to become the sin bearer. He lived a life that I couldn't even live, died the death I was supposed to die, and gave me a reward I don't deserve. It's by believing that he was the one that did that for me. And C, confessing him as Lord. You're in charge. Jesus didn't come and die on the cross to get you to a church. Jesus died on the cross to get you to heaven forever. He didn't get you to sit in a seat. People think that Jesus died and now he's got everybody sitting on on Sunday. He's going, oh, finally, they're sitting on Sunday. No, 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 no. He wants you forever. And that can happen right now with every head up, every, those that are watching in the annex, those that are watching around the world, those that are watching around the country. If you're here today and say, I want the resurrection and the life. I want the way. I want Jesus. I want to be born again. Pastor Tim, when you pray that prayer to be born again, include me. I want to be born. I want everybody to see if that's you with your hands up. I don't care who you are, where you came from. If you're saying, Pastor Tim, put me in that born again prayer. I want to start a journey with God today. Hold up your hand as high as you can. Hold them up. Hold them up. Hold them up. Hold them up. Keep them up. Over there, 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 there. Over here, gotcha. There, 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 there. Keep them up. Balcony, keep them up. I want to make sure we see every hand. Gotcha. Over there, over there, over there, over there. Hold those up. If you're online, type the word decide. Let's believe that God's going to come on. Pray this with me right now. Everybody in this place, say these words. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt and you died for it you faced hell for me so i wouldn't have to go you rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven a purpose on earth and a relationship with your father today lord jesus i turn from my sin to be born again okay now say this loud god is my father jesus is my savior The Holy Spirit is my helper. The Bible is my God. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen, 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 Amen.